Before the 7th century, the Arabian Peninsula was home to many different tribes, mostly following polytheism and living a nomadic lifestyle. The tribes often fought with each other, there was no political unity, and no strong central state existed. Big cities like Mecca and Medina, which was called Yathrib back then, were some of the most important centers for trade and religion. Everything started in 610, when Muhammad began receiving revelations from Allah, God, through the angel Gabriel, calling the people of Mecca to abandon polytheism and follow Islam, worshiping the one true God. But he faced strong opposition from the Quraysh nobles, who feared that Islam would weaken their power and economic influence. Because of the pressure and persecution, Muhammad and his followers migrated to Medina in 622. In Medina, Prophet Muhammad established the first Islamic state based on principles of justice, peace, and religious unity. This Islamic state wasn't just a religious community, but also a strong political institution, capable of defending itself and growing. As Islam continued to expand, important figures emerged like Zayd ibn Haritha, Muhammad's adopted son, Jafar ibn Abi Talib, his cousin, Abdullah ibn Rawaha, a poet and one of the earliest converts, and finally, Khalid ibn al-Walid, a skilled general who once fought against Muhammad for Quraysh. They were convinced by Islam's principles of justice, peace, and unity. So they converted to Islam and followed Muhammad, helping to strengthen the early Muslim community in Arabia. In the 7th century, after strengthening the Islamic State in the two most important religious centers, Mecca and Medina, Prophet Muhammad began to look beyond the Arabian Peninsula. His mission wasn't just about spreading Islam, it was something bigger. He wanted to build faith in one God, Allah, and establish peace in a world full of divisions and conflict, just like how he united the polytheistic, often warring nomadic tribes of Arabia. One of the ways he spread Islam was by sending letters to kings, rulers, emperors, and leaders in different regions. So, first, he sent letters to the neighboring rulers, including Emperor Heraclius of the Byzantine Empire, one of the biggest powers in the Middle East at that time. Back then, Heraclius had just come to power and saved the Byzantine Empire from the brink of collapse caused by the previous ruler, Phocas. He had also just finished a long, exhausting war with the Sasanian Empire, fighting to reclaim lost territory and recover the True Cross, a sacred Christian relic. But right as he was trying to rebuild, the rise of Islam started to become a big concern. The Muslim forces were expanding, and that was becoming a real threat to the Byzantine Empire, which was still in the process of recovery. One of the messengers that Prophet Muhammad sent to deliver his message to Heraclius was Harith ibn Umayr. He was tasked with inviting the emperor to recognize Islam. However, while passing through the region of Muta in present-day Jordan, Harith was captured, imprisoned, and eventually killed by Sharhabil ibn Amr, one of the leaders of the Ghassanid tribe. The Ghassanids were an Arab tribe living in southern Syria, but they were also loyal allies of the Byzantine Empire, protecting the Roman annexed lands from raids by nomadic Arab tribes and practicing Christianity. As Islam started to spread, some Ghassanid leaders sided with the Muslims, while others remained fiercely loyal to the Byzantines. This division led to intense conflicts within the tribe, creating a complex relationship between the Ghassanids and the Muslim forces. But no matter how much they hated each other, envoys were supposed to be protected. Attacking or killing a messenger was considered a serious violation of international law at that time. It was practically a declaration of war. The prophet was shocked when he heard the news of his envoy's death because this wasn't just a personal insult to him. It was a blatant violation of the diplomatic rules of that time. The prophet Muhammad knew that he couldn't just let this act slide without a response. If he did nothing, other tribes and empires would see it as a sign of weakness. To defend the honor of the Islamic State and respond to this violation, the Prophet decided to organize a military expedition to confront Shar Habil and the Ghassanid forces. Quickly, he ordered an army of 3,000 men be mobilized and dispatched to the north to discipline the transgressors. It was the largest Muslim army ever mobilized up to that time on this scale except in the course of the battle against the Confederates. He sent it under the command of Zaid bin Haritha to Muta to demand reparations. 
At the same time, he designated a chain of command and responsibility. If Zaid is martyred, Jafar ibn Abi Talib should take over his position. And if Jafar is martyred, Abdullah bin Rawaha should take over his position. The Prophet instructed the army, emphasizing the principles to follow in any expedition or mission. Fight in the name of Allah and in his cause. Fight those who disbelieve in Allah. Fight, but do not be treacherous, nor mutilate, nor kill a child. Khalid also participated in the expedition to Muta ordered by Muhammad with different aims. The purpose of the raid may have been to acquire booty in the wake of the Sasanian Persian army's retreat from Syria following its defeat by the Byzantine Empire in July. The Islamic army, under the leadership of Zayd ibn Haritha, departed from Medina towards the Levant and reached the town of Ma'an, located in present-day Jordan, after a strenuous and lengthy journey. Their plan should be a quick and decisive assault. They decided to take the people of Al-Sham by surprise, just as Allah's messenger always did in his raids. But then it came to shocking news. Byzantine force had come down to Ma'an, in the Al-Balka, with 100,000 Greeks joined by 100,000 men from Lakham, Judham, Alkain, Bara, and Bali, Arabian tribes allied to the Byzantines. However, the number of Byzantine troops has been a topic of debate for centuries. Early Islamic historians, like Ibn Ishaq and Al-Tabari, often claimed the Byzantine forces numbered between 100,000 to 200,000. While these massive figures are common in medieval battle reports, modern scholars believe they are exaggerated suggesting the real number was closer to 10,000, that led by one of Heraclius's generals, Theodoros. When the Muslims' army heard this, they spent two nights at Ma'an pondering what to do as they had never thought of encountering such a huge army. The Muslims fought 300 against 1,000 in Badr and won by the will of Allah. In Uhud, similarly outnumbered 3 to 1, they won again. But now, they were outnumbered almost 70 to 1. As expected, most of them wanted to wait and send for reinforcements from Medina. But that's not exactly what Abdullah ibn Ruwaha planned in his mind. Because the Muslim army was not what it used to be. The Muslim army in the 7th century evolved from tribal warriors into a highly organized and effective force. Initially, it was composed of tribal units from around Mecca and Medina, rooted in desert warfare traditions. These tribes, accustomed to raiding and defending in small units, had no formal army until they were unified by Islam. Islam provided a religious motivation, transforming tribal fighters into soldiers, fighting under a unified cause to defend and spread their faith. The Muslim soldiers were highly motivated by their belief in Islam and the promise of reward in the afterlife. The concept of martyrdom, shahada, played a key role where death in battle was seen as a path to paradise. And in this dark time, it really worked. Abdullah ibn Ruwaha immediately encouraged the men saying, O men, by Allah, what you dislike is that which you have come out for, martyrdom. We are not fighting the enemy with numbers or strength or multitude, but we are fighting them with this deen with which Allah has honored us. So come on, both prospects are fine, victory or martyrdom. The men were roused by these words, and their iman strengthened. They therefore went forward until they reached the village of Masharif. When the enemy approached, the Muslims withdrew to the village Muta. Battleground situated in a valley between two heights, which negated the Byzantines' numerical superiority, but giving the Muslim advantage. Rolling hills and rocky terrain, ideal for the Muslim army's tactics. Guerrilla warfare, using swift raids and hit-and-run attacks, leveraging their expertise in desert combat. There, the first significant military confrontation between the early Muslim community and the Byzantine Empire began. As the sun rose, tension hung in the air until the Roman battle horn shattered the silence. The Roman forces, including a unit of Christian Arabs, surged forward, eager to engage the Islamic army. At that moment, Zayd bin Haritha, the commander of the center Muslims force, rallied his troops and led them into battle. However, the fight turned brutal quickly and Zayd was gravely wounded by a spear. Strategically, the Islamic forces needed to capitalize on this momentum. Although they had faced heavy losses initially, they regrouped, thanks in part to Jafar's quick thinking. Jafar picked up the banner that had fallen from Zayd's hand. 
He organized the soldiers, preparing them for the next Roman attack. The Roman army, well equipped and experienced, was formidable, especially their Greek troops, who launched a coordinated counteroffensive. Now, the Islamic forces charged forward from both flanks, demonstrating the importance of flanking maneuvers in battle. This tactic aimed to divide and overwhelm the enemy, preventing them from effectively concentrating their forces. Among the brave fighters, Jafar stood out. He confronted the Greeks head-on, his determination shining as he took down enemy soldiers with each swing of his sword. However, as he fought valiantly, he sustained numerous injuries. Despite the overwhelming odds, he held on to the Islamic banner, symbolizing unity and resolve. His fierce determination inspired his comrades, and he fought until he could no longer stand, facing a massive Greek soldier that cut him in half. In a dramatic struggle, Jafar was finally brought down, but he left a legacy of courage in the heat of battle. As the battle raged on, Jafar's fate mirrored that of Zayd, and in his final moments, he prayed for Allah's forgiveness. It is said that he entered paradise, adorned with wings of rubies, a reward for his bravery and sacrifice. This moment underscored the importance of morale and leadership in battle, showing how personal sacrifice and faith can inspire others in the most desperate of circumstances. So, after the martyrdom of Jafar ibn Abi Talib, you can imagine the scene. The Muslims were struck with fear. Jafar was a beloved leader, and his death left a void. For a moment, it seemed like everything might collapse. The right and left wings of the army were in bad shape, and the Byzantine forces were not only numerous, but also very well equipped, like a tidal wave ready to crash down. The Byzantine army had the advantage when it came to armor, with many soldiers wearing chainmail, lamellar, or scale armor. This provided superior protection compared to the Muslim soldiers, most of whom had lighter leather or no armor at all. This would have made the Byzantines more resilient in prolonged combat, but the Muslim forces were quicker and more mobile due to their lighter gear. Then, Abdullah ibn Rawaha stepped up. He wasn't the most well-known commander at the time, but his bravery shone through. He picked up the banner where it had fallen, rallying the Muslims and ordering them to keep fighting. But even Abdullah felt the fear of death creeping into his heart as the situation looked dire. But in the heat of the moment, something changed in him. That initial fear of death transformed into courage. He managed to suppress his fear and led the charge, inspiring those around him. Yet, despite his bravery, Abdullah was wounded. He fought through it, pressing on, but the inevitable happened. He was killed, but it's said he entered paradise for his sacrifice, just like Jafar before him. As evening approached, the battlefield looked bleak for the Muslims, with both Jafar and Abdullah fallen, the army was left without leadership. The soldiers began to retreat, disheartened and unsure. On the other side, the Byzantine and Ghassanid forces, having inflicted heavy losses, were confident. However, despite their apparent advantage, they too had suffered many casualties. Now, imagine this. The Muslim soldiers, battered and tired, gathered on a high hill, and it felt like all hope was lost. But then, a figure stepped forward, Thabit ibn Arkham al-Ansari. He was a voice of reason in the chaos. Thabit proposed that they unite, that they didn't give up, and that they place their trust in a man who had already proven his strategic genius, Khalid ibn al-Walid. His strategic brilliance was evident during earlier conflicts, including the Battle of Uhud, where he executed a masterful flanking maneuver that turned the tide against the Muslims. Khalid's ability to adapt his tactics based on the battlefield's dynamics was unmatched. He excelled in mobility, often utilizing swift cavalry maneuvers to outmaneuver larger forces, which became a hallmark of his command style. Khalid's military talent stemmed from his deep understanding of warfare, honed during his early years fighting for the Quraysh against the Muslims. This experience gave him insight into the strengths and weaknesses of various strategies. He was also a keen observer of his opponents, studying their movements and formations, which allowed him to exploit vulnerabilities effectively. Before the Battle of Muta, Khalid was not present, as he had yet to convert to Islam. However, 
He was recognized for his capabilities after witnessing the initial Muslim setbacks against a larger Byzantine force. His reputation as a fierce warrior and strategist earned him immediate command upon converting, where he quickly adapted to the challenges faced by the Muslim army. In contrast to generals like Hannibal, renowned for his daring maneuvers, and Alexander the Great, famed for his swift campaigns, Khalid ibn al-Walid distinguished himself through unparalleled adaptability and tactical ingenuity. Unlike Napoleon, who excelled in logistics, Khalid's intuitive grasp of battlefield dynamics allowed him to swiftly recalibrate strategies, solidifying his legacy as one of history's most exceptional military commanders. And in this status quo, Khalid didn't waste time. He instantly held the banner and consulted with the remaining leaders and quickly devised a plan. The next morning, the two armies faced off once again, but something was different. Khalid had completely rearranged the Islamic army overnight. It wasn't just a minor tweak. He moved the soldiers who had been fighting on the right wing to the left and vice versa. He moved the ones who had been in the rear to the front and those in the front to the rear. Why? Simple but genius. He wanted to give the Byzantine forces the illusion that new reinforcements had arrived, as if fresh soldiers had come to bolster the Islamic ranks. Now think about the enemy's perspective. They had seen these same soldiers fighting for hours, some on the brink of exhaustion. And now, suddenly, they were staring at what they thought were new, fresh forces. The doubt and fear that began to seep into the Byzantine ranks were palpable. Could they really handle this seemingly never-ending flow of Muslim fighters? On the other side, the Byzantine commanders were determined. They blew their trumpets, signaling the attack. Soldiers charged, hoping to crush the Muslims once and for all. But Khalid had prepared the Muslim forces well. He advised his men to remain steadfast, to fight back with everything they had when surrounded and not allow themselves to be encircled. As the battle raged on, Khalid's strategy was clear. He wasn't looking for a reckless charge. He was focused on minimizing losses, ensuring that even if they had to retreat, they would do so in a way that inflicted maximum damage on the enemy. And it worked. The Byzantine forces struggled to gain ground, even as the Muslims seemed to fall back. But this wasn't a chaotic retreat. It was a tactical withdrawal. Every step back was calculated, and every blow struck against the Byzantines cost them dearly. By the time the Muslims reached the top of the hill, they had managed to avoid being surrounded or crushed, and they had inflicted significant casualties on the Byzantine army. The Byzantines, looking up at the hill, hesitated. They feared an ambush from behind the hill, suspecting that reinforcements might be waiting to pounce if they pressed on. At that point, General Theodore, leading the Byzantine forces, ordered his troops to retreat. They had already suffered too much and couldn't afford any more losses. Khalid bin Walid also left for the hill along with the remaining army. In this battle, the Muslims lost 2,000 lives. Nearly 70% of the Muslim army was martyred. Khalid bin Walid's leadership that day earned him a legendary nickname, Saifula, or the Sword of Allah. His quick thinking, bravery, and ability to turn a dire situation into a strategic victory. Though the battle wasn't a clear-cut win, Khalid managed to save the Muslim army from annihilation and led them back home with their honor intact. After the Battle of Muta, the Muslims who died there are remembered as martyrs, or Shahid. Many believe that this battle wasn't really a defeat for them. Instead, it showed their bravery by standing up to the Byzantines, and it helped establish their presence among the Arab Bedouin tribes in the region. To honor those who fell in battle, a mausoleum was built at Muta over their graves. Muhammad, the Prophet of Islam, passed away in 632 CE. After his death, Abu Bakr became the first Caliph. He quickly gained control over the entire Arabian Peninsula, especially after winning the Ridda Wars, also known as the Wars of Apostasy. These were a series of military campaigns against rebel tribes that had turned away from Islam after Muhammad's death. You see, the rebels argued that while they had followed Muhammad as the prophet, they didn't owe anything to Abu Bakr. Some of these rebels supported figures like Tulaiha, Musailima, or Saja, all of whom claimed to be prophets themselves. Most of the tribes that rebelled were defeated and brought back into the fold of the caliphate. 
Interestingly, the tribes surrounding Mecca didn't join in the revolts. In October 632, Abu Bakr sent Amr's forces to the Syrian border to deal with the rebellious tribes, particularly the Kuza'a and Wadia tribes, located around Tabuk and Daumat ul Jandal, which is in modern day Al Jaf. At first, Amr struggled to subdue the tribes. It wasn't until January, after the Battle of Yamama, that he was able to achieve this with the help of Shurhabil. With these rebellions crushed and Arabia united under Abu Bakr's leadership from Medina, he decided it was time to expand the Islamic State. It's a bit unclear what exactly his plans were, whether he wanted a full-scale expansion or was just looking to secure more land as a buffer against the powerful Sassanid and Byzantine empires. This desire to expand led to the Islamic conquest of Persia. Khalid ibn al-Walid, known for his military prowess, was sent into the Persian Empire with an army of around 18,000 volunteers. Their mission was to conquer Iraq, the richest province of the Persian Empire. Khalid's campaign was quite successful. After taking Iraq, the next step was to move on to Roman Syria, which was a major province of the Byzantine Empire. This set the stage for even more ambitious military campaigns and helped establish the early Muslim community as a formidable power in the region. The aftermath of these battles and conquests not only expanded the territories under Muslim control, but also laid the foundation for future Islamic governance and cultural influence. The unity achieved during Abu Bakr's caliphate was crucial for maintaining momentum, allowing subsequent leaders to build on his achievements. As a result, the Islamic Empire continued to grow, shaping the course of history in the Middle East and beyond for centuries to come.